episode of 28.4 FM. I'm joined today by not one, not two, but three co-hosts, Gaurav, Arya, and Sanskriti from Delhi and Mumbai. In case you're wondering why we have three co-hosts today, you won't have to think longer once we tell you who our guest is. As we had promised you in our first episode, we would bring you India's sharpest minds to talk about issues that are of direct relevance and of hopefully of some interest to you. And today's guest is no exception. So without much ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanian, currently India's chief economic advisor. Dr. Subramanian is a leading expert on economic policy, banking, and corporate governance. And he has done his PhD from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and is a top ranking IIM alumnus. He has also taught at the Indian School of Business where until recently he was a professor of finance. Dr. Subramanian, thank you so much for joining us today. We are really excited to talk to you. My pleasure, Abhishek, Arya, Sanskriti, and Gaurav. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a pleasure interacting with such you know, young and bright people. We are hoping to cover a lot of ground today from India's current economy to, uh, you know, questions about your journey to your current position. Um, and, and we're hoping to keep it as conversational as possible and, and, and have, you know, the chance to interact with you because we, we really do value your presence here. So I'm going to hand over to Sanskruti, who has a few questions on your career path so far and, uh, you know, your views on policy and governance. I'd like to firstly ask you a very fundamental question and something that's taking rounds across the country is the JE and NEET examination. Something that you have also given and something that you've briefly spoken about and being so heartbroken because of your CBSE board exam marks, but that didn't let you down. So I would like to ask you about the JE mains and the NEET examination and what would you like to tell the students that you are giving this examination across this, like the global pandemic right now? The first thing I would say is um, for every student, you know, no examination is the be all and end all. Um, I think that's the most important thing to remember. Um, life is much bigger than any examination. Uh, and, you know, if you think about life itself as an, as an examination, I think that is the best best way to approach it. That's the first thing I would you know mention, and and that's because you know those students who are taking this this exam you know um, now are taking it under extraordinary circumstances, um, and so I really you know empathize with them. You know I would suppose I were in this in this time you know um, let's say February March preparing thinking that I'll appear in the examination in May. And then um, the examination is not held. It actually is, you know, for, for uh, you know, not to blame anybody, it's just an exogenous shock of COVID. I think, um, you know, keeping your spirits up and continuing to work hard, you know, in times like that, I think is very difficult, especially during that period when, you know, one doesn't even know whether the exam would have been held or not, that uncertainty. So I, first of all, I think I would, you know, uh, just, you know, Sort of tip my hat to all the students uh, who are taking the exam this year because I think you know it's a it's a testimony to their resilience whoever decides to actually take the exam because you know I can easily empathize the difficulty with which um, they would have gone through I what on, only piece of advice I would I would give them is that you know be optimistic um, you know uh, and and in, in my own life, I've actually seen that, you know, uh, my, my failures have taught me far more than, than my successes. And, um, and so um, I would combine it with what, what, I, what I said earlier as well. No exam is the be all and end all. You know, if those of you, those of you who will do well and succeed, I think very, very good wishes to all of them. Um, but those who, let's say, you know, for various reasons, um, things if they don't work out, do remember that, you know, you will learn a lot from that. Um, and especially during a time like this. So let, 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 you know, uh, let, let no failure ever dishearten you, even whether it is NEET, NEET or, or JE now, or, you know, any other exam that you would take later. Um, so I, I think resilience is a quality that I would actually encourage all of you to build because 
that is a quality that you know helps you a lot um, you know go, going forward i just would um, use this you know a, 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 a cricketer whom i really admire i mean i've um, i've been a, i've been following cricket for a long while um, is rahul dravid um, you know he, it's um, and if you take the best innings test match innings that that he played and many of you i think today's generation may not appreciate this matches that much you may you know talk up on the 2020 generation i guess um, but he played this wonderful innings in edgbaston you know when the ball was swinging a lot you know and uh, it was him and sanjay bangar holding fort that enabled then saurav ganguly and sachin tendulkar to have a you know fantastic partnership and india won that test match but rahul dravid played i think by far the best innings that have among the best innings that i've seen because it was actually a test of both technique and temperament you know and in to do well in life you know both technique in other words capability hard work but temperament is also very very important and resilience is i think is one key aspect of that temperament so i would you know uh, encourage everyone to to develop their temperament you know use failures to to steel yourself more um, and and you know life is and those of you who um, you know have learned mathematics life is often at times like a sine curve you know there are basically there are there are peaks and there are troughs as well but when you will observe and i think now i can say this with experience the peaks usually are far longer than the troughs it's just that the troughs you know because it's emotionally you know a little bit more difficult troughs seem longer but actually if you look at in any person's life typically the peaks are longer you know just in terms of time so ye bhi you know ye 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 waqt bhi guzrega you know this also will pass is something that you have to keep in mind and and you know just grit through difficult times for so that's my build resilience and i think be honest to yourself i think you know when i look look back at myself um, i i think i've benefited a lot from being honest to myself my profession and to my country definitely thank you very much i'm definitely going to show this to my sister because she is preparing for neat uh, anyway um something that i want to ask yes thank you very much uh, something that i want to ask you is we see a lot of young people in sports in you know uh, in academia but we do not see a lot of young people in policy making and actual grassroots governance so as a chief economic officer what does your day look like especially for someone who is into policy making and governance someone who's new into policy making and governance so first sanskriti i would want to correct i am actually not really new into you know policy making and governance um, you know ever since i for you know, us for uh, apologies uh, for someone like us who's new who are new into policy making and governance okay. yes um so so how does my day look like um so b- before i say that you know i would say for an academic you know if there is a job in the government which is you know fit fit fits like like gloves on hands right um, it is the chief economic advisor's role i think it is the among all roles that government a government can offer actually in india i think is a chief economic advisor that is the best fit for an academic because it is you know about giving advice it is about thinking deeply about issues and you know um, um it it gives you i mean this role gives you a canvas that is unparalleled because anything that the government is involved in macroeconomics microeconomics you know sectoral stuff industry agriculture you know exports imports you know financial sector it, it just gives you a, such a broad mosaic of things to think about and work on i think it's a i mean i i i i just am incredibly privileged um to 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 have gotten this opportunity and i you know and i from the bottom of my heart actually thank those who who given me this opportunity um one quality of mine is actually is, is sincerity so i say that this with with utmost sincerity um so um it it, it is i think uh, a role that makes you think so i for instance start my day usually you know i will i read stuff read um i i am you know some i i then do about an hour of yoga typically um that's something which i um you know it 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 helps me stay in good spirits and then i spend my day you know um reading the newspapers days newspapers to be current 
in order to, to basically see what's happening around the day. Um, and then there are meetings and I actually then spend my um, day in the evening, again, reading, more, reading, you know, it could be academic papers it, and, I, and it could be books as well, because this job involves thinking and, you know, and in order to think, you have to read. Um, so I, 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 I do read a lot more academic papers, um, some, some policy stuff as well, um, and, and, and books too. So I think, uh, you know, and, and that's something that I really enjoy. I actually, um, you know, my, my, my kids, for instance, tease me saying, oh, you don't have a reading habit at all because you don't read any fiction, you know. <laughs> um, but that's because I, most stuff that I read is, you know, is, is um, uh, uh, academic and, you know, policy and it's just mostly scientific kind of stuff. So, but I, that, that's something I enjoy. So the advice I would actually give you is, you know, this is something which I've always mentioned to, to my students as well. Um, it's not just for policy making, but a broader piece of advice, you know, make a two by two matrix. Those of you who want to actually, what is the stuff that you want to do in life? You know, on one dimension, you have what you enjoy. On the second dimension, you have what you, what you're good at. Um, now, suppose you actually are, are at the, let's say the top, you know, top left corner, which is you're doing something or you want to do something that you enjoy and you're good at, you know, you've hit gold dust. Just, you don't have to think twice, just go ahead, just do that. Um, if you are at the bottom right corner, neither do you enjoy nor are you good at, you know, then quickly run away from that and, you know, look to get into one of the other three cells. Um, so the, the choices are very easy in these two cells. The difficulty oftentimes comes when you have to choose between the, you know, the top, uh, top you know, the bottom, bottom right and the top left, which is, you know, if you have to choose between something that you are, that you enjoy, but possibly not so good at, at this point in time, and something that you, you know, that you don't enjoy as much, but you're good at at this point in time. Um, I would say in that as well, go by what you enjoy, because if you do what you enjoy, you know, work does not seem like work. Um, you know, work basically is fun. And something that is fun, you can keep doing it for 14, 15 hours a day. And when you do it for 14, 15 hours a day, you will become good at it as well. So over time. And so, you know, I would basically say, do what you enjoy. Don't put the cart before the horse, you know, uh, the, so the way I would put it in a, in a sort of a, in, in the form of a, a, a saying is, if your only ambition in life is to become rich, it shows an extreme poverty of ambition. So, you know, um, so, so it's basically just, just wanting to be rich is I think extremely poor in terms of, in, in terms of ambition. So it, that, that saying is also embedded in do what you enjoy. You know, I think rest of it, things, money, power, pelf, privilege, everything, you know, other stuff will come, you know, but just do what you, what you enjoy. Uh, it could be politics. If it is so great, you know, I think India needs uh, young minds, people who, you know, with good values, um, you know, and capabilities to come in, you know, to, to be into politics. And, and that combination is important. And, and my advice basically would be for those who want to come into politics as well, you know, come in, but don't compromise. You know, we, when you are young, we all actually have high values. Um, but, you know, those of us who continue to be young, we, we, we stay young because we don't let our values to be compromised. I think that I would, I would um, strongly recommend for all, all youngsters, especially, you know, those who want to get into politics. Definitely. Sir, just quickly jumping in on the CEA uh, role itself, can you tell us a little bit about how that role fits into the consultative process? It does, does a reform, for example, an Atmanirbhar Bharat package, uh, would, would that go from the government uh, to you where you give them a, an assessment or would the government come to you before drafting policies where you give input at that stage? Uh, and, and just tell us a little bit about your team and, and, and composition and stuff if you can. So, um, you know, as, as you would know, the chief economic advisor is part of the Ministry of Finance. Um, so, um, and the, um, the Ministry of Finance actually has, you know, um, there is the Department of Revenue, there's the Department of Expenditure, 
there's a department of you know economic affairs um then there is also the de department for you know for for investment where and and you know asset monetization um so so the and and these are these are the these are the the departments that are part of the ministry of finance so the team is comprised of therefore secretaries from each of these each of these um departments to, together with the chief economic advisor under the leadership of the um, you know of the, of the finance minister um so you know all the all the ideas that come about are basically are a team effort you know um they get debated you know within the within the ministry they are also debated at you know with other ministries you know and are um you know involve presentations at the highest level uh, thinking about you know and and internally the deliberations are very very honest and um you know and 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 often times quite passionate as well um and and you know that's 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 been my experience uh, where we are encouraged to share our you know our 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 views um and and then the you know the policies then are evolved based on 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 that kind of debate um in terms of the team per se so i actually have you know um a, a, so i have a, a set of senior indian economic service officers um the uh, who who are all basically in charge of you know different units for instance there's a unit you know um and, and headed by um, an officer who's of the joint secretary level or could be also additional secretary level um you know in charge of macro economics there's a unit in terms you know in charge of fiscal policy um someone in charge of agriculture someone in charge of industry climate change um you know then then in the uh, hu the human 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 resources which is includes stuff like you know social sector so these based so i have various teams of of you know of indian economic service officers who themselves have bigger teams that they they work with they also work with you know the individual ministries um so for instance just to give an example of some of the uh, changes in labor laws that are happening as just the way things would happen um so you know we wrote about how labor laws you know are um, are sort of um responsible to at least partially um for firms being very small you know in india and we basically then recommended that labor laws should get relaxed that you know some of the restrictions should be removed so this involved actually the you know our ministry together with the ministry of labor discussing these things um and then in the implementation of this now many states are implementing it you know and the center is also implementing it so the ministry of finance you know works closely with the ministry of labor in you know in in coming up with this so it's actually a, a um sort of a you know a, a synergistic exercise and i look at the chief economic advisor's office in nagain i'll use a parallel um you know harsha bhogle you know you, as you all know is a very famous cricket commentator um harsha bhogle used to say that his role in the commentary box was to make sunil gavaskar look better and you know so i actually view uh, the chief economic advisor also as similar to harsha bhogle to make, make basically the sunil gavaskar's look better because they are the ones who are finally going and implementing and they are the ones who are actually batting that definitely serves as an analogy to whatever you said but i would like to ask you something about like your pub, like the pub, your in appointment is indirect but uh, what about public opinion and public participation in the policy making process so how much of weightage is given to the marginalized section to the migrant workers to some to like the minorities so it does that also weigh in, into your policy making and your actual implementation of the policy of course very much um you know uh, b- before i answer that questions first firstly let's understand i'm sure you've learned this you know in in the democracy right in a democracy you know there the um it's people's re- representation through which the members of parliament or the members of um you know legislative assemblies that are elected um and they are elected based on you know a certain agenda that they lay before the before the public um if the if the public you know one likes the agenda and second believes that 
you know this particular person is likely to implement the agenda uh, based on that then the you know he or she gets elected and there's there's a lot of research in you know in in political science also which shows that on average you know voters look at basically the agenda and the cred the credibility of the agenda and the credibility of the candidate itself you know of course you know there are distortions in in every democracy you know um, as uh, which but but on average these are this is what basically gets you know the the, the particular um, you know member of the parliament or legislative assembly getting elected the party themselves also parties also have a you know have a have an agenda that they lay lay out through their you know campaign um, uh, document right um, so in that since you know th- th- now of course the your question is once a government is elected for 5 years let's say right in between you know how does how does public opinion you know uh, get factored in i think now uh, in the in the in the age of social media you know this has become you know quite um, pronounced because uh, things come out very quickly and um, in fact if you see many of the you know many of our leaders are very active on on social media and they they do take the 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 you know uh, the opinions and so uh, and we you know for, for instance internally we also look at what's going on and incorporate that into our into our policy making to to give you you know on the specific issue that you raised about migrant labor yes. you know think about why is it that uh, some of the some of these as you know some of the difficulties that that uh, you know manifested why did they why did they happen because of some vulnerabilities that the migrant labor faces you know one of them is is the fact that our um, you know the there isn't port- portability of the public distribution system so if you are let's say a laborer you know who who lives in bihar and has you know come to bombay to work um, then if you are in bihar you can access the public distribution system you can get rice wheat you know cereals etc and maybe even pulses sugar and and so you know your essentials are taken care of um, but when you are you know in bombay you because your ration card is 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 you know has bihar in it you can't go and access it now when you are you know when you face a prospect let's say of a you know or pro- face the prospect of a lockdown and your essentials possibly getting affected then you would think that you know being back in bihar is better because of that vulnerability um and now so what the government is therefore doing is working on one nation one ration card which is primarily intended for migrant labor um, to reduce their vulnerabilities um, similarly you know the, the 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 government is actually also working on on you know on uh, enabling you know um, credit for some of the uh, giving them credit you know to those that are some of the people who sell on the on the you know on on the street street vendors for instance so these are basically ways of taking care of some of the vulnerabilities that got highlighted you know uh, the way the way you 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 mentioned so and at the same time there are also you know um, uh, for instance there are grievances that come um, you know and those get forwarded to 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 us um, and we 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 look at that and and that's the that's how the mechanism is also you know for feedback is incorporated so uh, before we move on from the cea's functions itself one of the key functions of the cea cea is to present the indian economic survey before the budget is released which i think is a wonderful document because it really sort of gives an indication of how you're viewing the economy the key risks and opportunities and what's gone on in the past year um you know since you mentioned the migrant labor a uh, sort of crisis that happened in in earlier this year your predecessor in one of his economic surveys actually tried to estimate the number of migrant laborers which is one of the first sort of comprehensive efforts to do so um can you just tell us on your sort of philosophy of the indian economic survey who your target audience is and and sort of how that comes together so you know firstly i i think you know that's the best part of the ca role which is you know um, not only so so the economic survey comes in two volumes you know right. which is the second volume is a survey of what has happened but you know um, in the last 5 years you know both under my predecessor and currently volume 1 has basically is is the outlet where you know very careful research is brought 
on the policy options and what you know um, should basically get done in terms of um, you know the, the various policy changes for instance if you look at many of the reforms that have been announced as part of the atmanirbhar bharat package uh, whether it's labor reforms whether it is the change in the msme definition or you you know the privatization basically the agenda for privatization right. these have come from you know the ideas that have been brought in the economic survey based on very careful research um in fact you know um i i think india in that way is actually very unique where a government document you know brings in such high quality research to to you know for for for, for policy and that i think is the best part of the you know of the of the, of the chief economic advisor's role um so i will give you the example of you know um the chapter that we wrote on thalinomics um you know the the reason we wrote that chapter is when you think about something you know as um uh, you know important as inflation um but when you think about inflation and the difference between nominal quantities and real quantities which is and and, and they are related to this idea of purchasing power um purchasing power depends on inflation uh, but most common people will not be able to understand inflation that well because inflation is a rate of change but most of us you know common people relate you know um, with inflation based on the just the pr- price level and what is more common than a plate of food which we encounter you know at at least twice a day uh, but you know in, in many cases thrice a day so we basically keep you know kept the common person in mind and you know something that the common person really uh, want, you know cares about which is inflation and created this thali index to convey the idea of you know price changes and price levels so i'm using this example to convey that you know um, finally in a democracy economics has to appeal to the common person has to be has to uh, be be something that the common person should be able to relate with and so you know when i have been um, you know working on the economic surveys um i have been guided by by uh, gandhi ji's talisman which is think about the you know the 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 person the most vulnerable person and i think it's also i would say you know my own upbringing and my my own you know background helps me because i come from where you know very humble background and so i have actually uh, seen a common person's life you know um in in you know uh, and and so i can relate to to to, to that very well so um that's something which i keep in mind uh, but at the same time what is also important is to make sure that the document you know is something that is really useful for policy and here you know what is important is to distinguish between correlation and causality so you know and that's something with the economic survey really tries to do i'll i'll give a you know i'll just use a folk story to to illustrate this so there is a story that uh, is mentioned you know in our folk folk tales which is a crow comes and sits on the branch of a tree and at that time a fruit falls the crow thinks that the that it made the fruit fall when it may have just been correlated events you know co- the crow is basically attributing causation when it may have just been correlation so policy documents have to actually be you know have to uh, attribute causation because you know if you do x you will get y and that is a causal statement so you know the rigor that we bring into the economic survey is to actually you know not just show correlation but show causation and that's why so we we try to strike that balance you know and so that the survey is accessible to a common person but at the same time has the level of rigor that is really necessary for a policy oriented document just a quick follow up on the ies and i i completely agree with you i think that everyone who's interested in economics or even if they're not should read it because it's an important vision statement of the of the cea and how we view things um in this year's ies i was pleasantly surprised to read from uh, you know someone in government because ies may be mistaken as indian economic survey services of, well. of course indian economic services so uh, surveys not services uh, you know i was pleasantly surprised to read about the so the emphasis that you gave on wealth creation as well as the unintended consequences of excessive government regulation uh, you know this is something that 
is said a lot in uh, you know the intellectual space, but not enough in the political space. So I guess my uh, the tenor of my question is: Have your views on this evolved after you've been inside government, where you have to take into consideration other factors beyond just economics? Or uh, do you view your job as, you know, saying what is economically sound, uh, regardless of whether or not it's entirely politically feasible? So let, let me answer the second part of your question right away. You know, I, I believe it is my dharma to actually say what is economically right. And, you know, I, my karma is, is directed by my dharma. And so I, you know, I do not take into account, you know, um, other considerations because I, my role is to actually say what is the right thing. And that is what I, I take that very seriously. And that is, you know, internally, uh, what I, what I uh, bring about now, you know, your, the first part of your question, which is, um, on, uh, you know, on, on, uh, wealth on ethical wealth creation, I think, yes. you know, survey talked about ethical wealth creation. I think it did not talk only about wealth creation. I think that is very important to keep in mind. Um, and this is, you know, this idea of course has evolved in, you know, the 10 years that I have been in India after having done my PhD. So of course, you know, um, in, I, I three quarters of my life has been spent in India. I spent a decade in the United States, but you know, uh, when I came back, um, I have seen that, you know, um, this is true, not only in India, but, you know, many where may, may elsewhere in the world as well, that, uh, when you look at sustainable models, you know, when you look at firms that have really, you know, stood the test of time or, you know, firms that have, um, you know, a, a sort of become, um, legendary, you know, or even countries you know, they have done that by focusing on the long run, um, not just, you know, in a bubble like manner where you created wealth for, let's say a short period by, you know, um, not wonder, not caring about the process, um, just thinking about the outcome. Um, and I think, you know, if you can, take, there are many examples that you will read about today, some of them who are basically fighting extradition, you know, in, in the, in, in, you know, the kingdom. Um, uh, so, so those are the kind of examples of, you know, short run behavior, myopic behavior. Yeah. Um, you know, if, when, 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 uh, when, when, when the, you know, uh, dust settles down, you know, all of us gravitate towards people who have done the right thing. Um, and, and, you know, that is something which companies have to have to, you know, to, to, to uh, appreciate countries also have to appreciate. And that is why the theme for this year's survey was ethical wealth creation. Um, and, and, you know, and this, that's the other important part, which actually I brought in, which is, you know, while I, you know, I have been fortunate and, you know, Abhishek, you've been fortunate as well to, you know, to, 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 to learn the Western view of the world. Um, you know, where we've educa been educated, but you know, it's also we have to recognize that the that India has had a very rich literature, you know, on on various aspects, you know, including economics and um, you know, Arthashastra, for instance, yeah. Tirukkural in the south, um, which you know, they may not have been mathematical models there, um, you know, um, but. but Economic ideas were definitely advocated in our in our you know literature, and I I look at literature as anything that is that is you know a printed word. It doesn't include only that stuff stuff that has been written in the you know in the last hundred years or hundred and fifty years. It also includes stuff that has been written over the last thousand years. Um, you know, and so that's the perspective. You know, so the Indian perspective is something we have to actually appreciate. That's part of our, you know, our, of our culture, part of our ethos. And, you know, it, it's something, you know, uh, George Madison actually showed in his work that for three quarters of known economic history, India was the dominant economic power in the world, accounting for about three quarter, about one third, you know, at touching sometimes almost 40% of global GDP. And, and that happened because of the marriage of the invisible hand of markets as Adam Smith, you know, coined. 
together with the hand of trust. Um, and that's the model that really enabled India to create wealth. And, you know, in fact, if you look at our socialist, um, you know, era about 50 years, that is very, that is ephemeral compared to the, the history of markets, trade, and, you know, combined with ethics. So that's the bigger idea that I also wanted to bring to, you know, to, to everybody, but especially the youngsters to understand that, you know, it is not just that all the economic ideas have just been borrowed from the West. You know, there are, there were many ideas that were there. So this economic survey was basically as many media outlets combined, you know, old Indian wisdom combined with new economics. Um, and that's the benefit of, of my training, uh, which is basically the, the, you know, the, the, the new economics thought for, you know, but at the same time, my background and my, and, and the, you know, the upbringing that I've had, which is where the old Indian wisdom actually, you know, comes from. And speaking of old Indian wisdom, uh, you know, your colleague in government, Sanjeev Sanyal, often talks about the Kautilian state or the Chanakyan state, um, which is the state that does what is necessary, but doesn't go beyond its functions. Uh, it, you know, a lot of a lot of criticism of the Indian sort of, uh, you know, system or state, as you call it, would be that we're trying to do too much with not enough resources. For example, we're trying to do, you know, as much as perhaps maybe some Western governments are doing without spending as much on uh, the state apparatus itself. Uh, is that is that a view that you share now that you've been in government? Or do you think that, you know, by nature of our uh, of our economic system, we sort of, uh, you know, need a larger state and, 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 and we're sort of condemned to be with a larger state regardless? Uh, no, I, you know, I, I, I don't share that cynical view for sure. Um, um, I, I think, you know, the chapter on, on, on less state intervention that I, that, that we wrote as part of the survey was part of the broader point of ethical wealth creation that, you know, et, well, as I said earlier as well, you know, the idea is to marry the invisible hand of markets together with the hand of trust. And when you have to marry the invisible hand of markets, that means less intervention, you know, um, at the same time, not zero intervention because Correct. as the COVID crisis and the global financial crisis have highlighted, you know, there are limits to markets. Markets work 95% of the time, you know, 90 to 95% of the time. They don't work 100% of the time. I think that nuance also has to be understood. So there are, there is role for state in creating public goods, providing public goods, etc. But not necessarily being in business because, you know, typically private sector incentives are stronger and they bring in more efficiency. So that is the, the idea. Now, you know, the, the, um, your, the, the, the broader point about, um, about, about, you know, state intervention itself, what, what, what needs to be, um, you know, kept in mind is that the United States, which is typically used as sort of a, you know, a, 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 you know, a model of a capitalistic economy and India, you know, the, our histories need to be understood. So the United States, for instance, you know, started primarily as, you know, mostly as a laissez faire kind of economy. It's only after the Great Depression that they actually brought in some some state intervention. For instance, you know they didn't have a central bank um, Correct. after the Great Depression. That's when they so so they moved from basically almost a laissez faire to to you know then then realizing that some state intervention is required. That you know total laissez faire does not deliver you know um, you know as much as much welfare. India, on the other hand, is, you know, and I'm talking about only the pre, only the post-independence history. Though our, you know, if you look at our overall much longer history, we've actually been a country that respected markets a lot and enabled the private sector. But if you look at our post-independence history, we basically have started as a socialistic, where the state was doing everything. So now, you know, we are sort of. So in some sense, if you look at the evolution of the US and India, we're coming from two opposite ends of the spectrum. So, you know, on one end, states doing basically everything, which is sort of India in the pre-liberalization, you know, pre, pre, pre in a post-independence era, the United States starting from the other extreme. So this process is basically continuing. And, you know, I think um, we, we are basically compared to earlier, we are reducing a lot of, you know, role of state uh, where, where it's not necessary. And at the same time, also bringing it where it's necessary. 
I'll just give you the example of you know the Essential Commodities Act, the you know the changes that have happened there, the changes in the Agriculture Produce and Marketing you know um, um, Act, APMC Act. So these are all parts of basically, and there's something that we highlighted that state intervention in these may not have been you know may may have been required in an earlier era in India where food shortages were there, but today it's not required. So India should basically, I mean, we should exit out of. So the broader point is that we do need to reduce state intervention in the in you know in and thereby enable markets a lot more. Um, but at the same time, as the private sector evolves, we also need you know much more efficient and effective regulation because you know without regulation, private sector can also go ahead and skelter. And I'll just give you you know with a parallel. Think about a river, a bank, well banked river. When the river has good banks, the water actually flows in a streamlined manner and reaches the fields actually where it's intended and creates prosperity in the in the form of crops and you know. Uh, but suppose those banks get broken, then the water goes helter skelter and actually there are, it's flood creates floods and basically creates a lot of destruction. So you know, in an economy, I I think about you know effective regulation as that bank that enables private sector activity to flow very well. Similarly, ethics basically also you know the hand of trust, hand of ethics being married with the hand of invisible you know that is like the bank that enables you know ethical wealth creation to happen and thereby long term prosperity. I think that your uh, your point on sort of. Uh, trust is so important. I think trust in the system is very important before you carry out any reforms. And I think that's a great segue into our next question, which has to do with the NPA crisis. Now you've highlighted this, you know, extensively in the economic survey of last year about the hangover of the NPA crisis and how that's weighing down on both credit growth and investment that are, you know, key drivers of uh, sort of short and long term, short and medium term growth in the country. In the same way, and we've seen, uh, you know, the Atma Nirbhar package sort of supports MSMEs using a lot of credit guarantees. Um, do you think the failure to resolve the NPA crisis to a meaningful degree before we came into sort of this crisis is going to impact our ability to facilitate credit growth, especially to MSMEs and not the larger co- uh, sort of corporations who have access to the corporate debt market and, and financing in other ways? So Abhishek, I think, you know, the question that you're asking is a very, very important one. Um, I would, um, you know, answer this by, you know, uh, taking a longer vision of the Indian banking sector. Um, And, you know, um, here I will, I will um, acknowledge that, yes, the Indian banking sector has, of course, you know, over the last many years has done, you know, um, good work in India. Um, but you know, now as the fifth largest economy in the world, we have to start benchmarking our banking sector globally. And I will use uh, again, you know, a, a cricket parallel here. Um, you know, Mahendra Singh Dhoni retired, uh, 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 you know, f- about a month or so back. The reason all of us appreciate Mahendra Singh Dhoni is because the you know, team that the cricket team that he led. We, you know, went and won all over the world. It basically they won the you know the the IP the two T Twenty World Cup in South Africa, the Champions Trophy in England. Um, they they won you know the World Cup in India. So it, you know it's a it's a team that acknowledged itself through its performances across the world. Contrast that to the team that you know that we had in the 1990s. You know, none of you would have actually seen that team, but I have you know experienced <laughs> with that with that cricket team. You know, they were basically tigers at home, but were, but were lambs abroad. And you know, I used to I used to really get very very you know upset with that with that with that cricket team. The Indian banking sector today is like that 1990s cricket team, which actually is you know possibly can pride itself on doing stuff in the at the Indian level, but when benchmarked against the global econ you know banking sector, it's puny. Um, for instance, you know, if you take the um, global top 100 banks, in the, you know, the top 100 banks globally, India has one bank in the global top 100, and that's a 55th ranked State Bank of India. This is for an economy that is fifth largest in the world. If our banking sector was as large as the size of the economy, we should have had six banks in the global top 100. 
if you look at any economy that has you know that has that has grown you know in and has become a dominant economy it is because of the support of the banking sector the united states is a very good example but take china and japan you know in the heyday when japan was growing you know very fast almost 18 of the top 25 you know banks in the world were japanese today you know if you take there are 12 uh, you know banks that are chinese that are you know in the top 100 um, i think 12 or 18 but but very large number um so you know if you even take countries like singapore sweden you know which are which are a fraction of the indian economy size about 1/8 or 1/6 they have three times as many banks in the global top 100 as we have so the indian banking sector needs to basically invest a lot more in technology you know leapfrog on technology so that they can use data analytics etc to to basically make sure that you know corporations cannot you know hoodwink them after taking credit um, you know and and this is where artificial intelligence can be so you know useful in in using data and analytics to avoid default you talked about willful defaulters you know um, and that's something which which is very important that the indian banking sector you know gets over i'll use this par- you know again i'll give uh, you know an example from sport this time from chess um there is this chess software um deep thought that was created using artificial intelligence um you know this software ended up defeating the highest elo rated player ever in the world gary kasparov and the the software was not even taught the rules of chess it was just you know fed the games um it learned the rules of chess learned the tactics in chess and learned the strategy of chess and defeated the smartest chess player ever in the world right if you know why am i using this example thing compared to the tactics and strategy in chess the tactics or strategy used by a corporation to willfully default is childish so if ai and machine learning can defeat chess you know the chess, you know the chess player defeating the tactics and strategy of willful default is childish it's very easy provided you know we basically just put our heads down to to get to put together data the data and believe in the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning you know and and leapfrog on this so to summarize basically you know several difficulties in the banking sector which is you know not enough credit um, you know the will be defaults and npas all those we can really leapfrog and circumvent by investing in technology and this in, includes not only public sector banks even private sector banks those private sector banks that have actually invested in you know in data analytics have primarily done so only for for retail credit credit to people like you and me you know for a for a you know maybe a home loan or a you know or a car loan etc but not in you know the large credit that is given to corporations our private sector banks also need to actually use far more technology and data and analytics to actually figure out models for corporate lending and you know the, the 1000 crore loans ensuring that those don't don't default um, so this is a huge opportunity for the banking sector and and that's something that they should actually really avail so uh, just before our next question we have a lot of follow ups that i want to be mindful of your time do you have a sort of do you have sort of yeah. a hard stop maybe last maybe a couple of questions and then um, Okay, sure. So let me hand over to then uh, uh, Arya and Gaurav to finish up. So we are in the midst of something unprecedented, and as you have stated earlier, it is a once in a lifetime kind of event. So, so my question is: as we navigate the COVID nineteen pandemic and the surrounding health and economic crisis, what are some of the green shoots and opportunities you can see that suggest towards a V shaped economic recovery? that can stimulate demand and consumer confidence most importantly so gorav actually wrote a piece in the indian express on you know on tuesday um you know on 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 this um where um we showed several high frequency indicators um my office um monitors about 60 high frequency indicators on a on a weekly basis um and for instance if you look at the eway bills eway bills in the month of august of this year are at almost 98% of the level last year um if you look at the uh, the 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 
um, the, the f railway freight um, and freight is actually because it involves transport is a good indicator of of you know of of the how the economy is doing uh, railway freight in the month of july of 2020 of this year was at 95% of the level last year in august it is it's 106% so it's 6% higher um, similarly if you look at cement production steel production um, you look at you know power consumption um, you know if you look at the um, a few more high frequency indicators that we actually highlighted in the i think you know yeah um, if, if you look at the foreign portfolio investment that is coming in the fdi that's coming in you know many of these indicators they clear clear point to the fact that there is there was a sharp decline in the you know because of the lockdown so in q in the first quarter sharp decline and then now there is a recovery that is that is happening you know some of these indicators have come back to about 80 87 89 90% of the pre covid levels so there is a recovery but you know it, it's not i'm not saying that they're actually back to 100% but there are many of them are back to almost 90 95 for in another thing for instance look at you know uh, the the uh, dig digital economy if you look at retail financial transactions for instance retail financial transactions you know in the month of august were double that of what it was last year so i mean you were talking about green shoots and the opportunities so the digital economy is something that is really emerging as a big you know opportunity in the in the in the current environment similarly exports you know um, as the as consumption in some of the you know other econ you know uh, other economies in the globe is increasing uh, you know exports actually have a good opportunity to 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 to, to pick up um, similarly some of the sectors that you know uh, you know firms where which are and firms and sectors that are looking to move away from china uh, these are you know very important um, you know sectors that are um, really um, you know in re really opportunities i will again mention i think the banking sector as a big opportunity um, given the given the emergence of the digital economy you know our banking sectors and our banks have to figure out lending based on just cash flows traditionally if you look at the way loans have been given by banks they've been given based on some asset it could be your you know let's say you give your house as a mortgage or you basically give your factory or maybe car just based on assets as mortgage but you know given the emergence of the digital economy and india being a very you know service oriented economy our banks have to figure Figure out, you know, cash flow based lending, and here's a, here's where technology, data, digital economy is a big opportunity um, that that you know the COVID 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 really presents. So these are extraordinary times, but as you know, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention, and indeed, you know that is that is happening. So following up on the last part, so in the light of the pandemic and the subsequent disruption to the global supply chain, we have seen some major uh, manufacturing giants. shift their production hubs from china to other countries do you think what role should the governments and citizens collectively play to make india an export driven superpower especially at a time when nations are becoming increasingly inward looking so this is something which uh, gaurav you know we wrote very clearly about you know in the chapter on um, exports so on network products um, see if you look at the um, chinese export performance versus the indian export performance one thing that stands out very clearly is that we in india have not you know focused on some specific sectors and really poured our all our energies into that we've been sort of all over the place um the chinese on the other hand picked ex you know labor intensive sectors and really directed their energies into into those sectors so if you enough and this is you know um, economically this is called the impact of specialization versus diversification so india has been very very diversified in terms of the product categories that it has you know uh, focused on in export so it just been sort of all over the place china on the other hand has had has been very specialized so first thing we basically need to be doing is you know we we should focus on a few sectors um for instance textile something that is you know historically has been a you know a, a strength for india 
um, network products, you know, which is uh, those that are part of global value chains within network products, electronics, uh, you know, goods in particular. Um, I, I would, you know, then um, the the medical equipment, which is emerging as a as a big, um, you know, opportunity opportunity now post COVID, and the automobile sector as well. Um, you know, so so these are the kind of sectors that we should be focusing on, and I will, you know. Um, one of the other key ideas that we have to you know keep in mind when thinking about exports is is the fact that you know um, in any industry the going up the sort of the, the the value chain happens you know in a gradual manner which is you know in any sector companies start by first assembling you know um, importing components assembling them and exporting and then they integrate backwards, manufacturing the components, ancillaries, all that. And the automobile sector is a very good example of that in India. You know, in back in the 70s, Maruti was basically importing components, you know, from Suzuki, um, assembling that and selling it in India. Then slowly the, you know, the entire components, auto components, auto ancillary sec sector developed, you know, around, uh, around India. And now India is actually, you know, um, especially for some of the smaller cars, all the products are also produced in India. So it was a gradual shift. And if you look at countries, two countries that have grown based on exports, Japan and China, you know, both of them followed this model, which is that first they actually started assembling and, you know, used FDI and, you know, joint ventures, etc. So they got technology as well from the advanced economies then and then gradually moved into manufacturing those components. So this is also a very important part of the export strategy. So specialization, focusing on labor intensive sectors and second, you know, gradual start, you know, moving first starting with, with assembly and then backward inter integrating to manufacturing the entire value chain. So uh, I have a question, sir, about the 2008 uh, financial stimulus package. Uh, the failure to taper it down after the package was given, the failure to taper it down has led to inflation. So is this aftermath, is this weighing on your mind? On a recent NDTV interview, you also highlighted India's response to the Asian financial crisis as a template to follow. So due to the nature of the format, you weren't able to elaborate. And over here, could you please share a bit about how that response may have guided you? I think, you know, Arya, you asked one question, but you asked the best question, you know, in the, um, you know, in, in the entire session. Um, so, um, yes, the, there are important learnings uh, between, you know, between uh, the response to the Asian financial crisis and the, uh, the response to the uh, global financial crisis. Um, so, I, I would, and here I would like to recall that you know, in the Indian economy, when, when growth was slowing down, people said, oh, that our potential growth rate is basically declining. But, you know, I want to remind people that, you know, three years around the Asian financial crisis, 2000, 2001, 2002, we recorded growth rates of 3.8%, 4.8%, and 3.8%. So, now, in other words, we had average growth of less than 4% during these, during these three years. And at that time, we basically did the, you know, we did fiscal expansion, you know, we built the golden quadrilateral, um, invested in, you know, we, we did a lot of divestment at that time. Um, you know, that's when the ministry, in fact, for this, when this, in, this investment was created. So, and, and implemented some of the small scale industry reforms, you know, there were a lot of restrictions, basically, products could be manufactured only by small scale before that. And these reforms were undertaken, you know, during that time, the combination of the fiscal spending, the reforms and the disinvestment, then delivered growth of 8% on average, starting from 2003 onwards, um, up till 2008. In fact, you know, it is my firm belief that the growth that happened in the UPA one years was the lag effect of these reforms. You know, it was it, it, it did not have as much to do with policies that were implemented during that time. You know, and this is this is true because in any economy, the measures that are taken 
the effect of policy measures, the effects of those are felt with significant lags. You know, um, and especially when it's reforms, the lags are you know the lags are long, um, and that's why I actually firmly believe that the growth that happened in UPA one was because of the measures taken during this time. Now let me contrast this with basically what happened after the global financial crisis, where the while we did the spending, we did not firstly the quality of the spending was very poor. Um, you know, it, for instance, a large part of that money was. For you know, good part of it was for a for a debt waiver program, which really you know ended up going in the hands of of large farmers, those that did not deserve at all. Uh, and we did not do any reforms at all. Uh, together with that, we also combined it with very poor lending, you know, telephone banking, etc. So on the one hand, we basically ended up spending money and doing very poor quality investment. At the same time, you know, we didn't have any structural reforms and we did not have um, you know we, we basically then you know really sowed the seeds for the entire npa crisis and you know this is important because typical corporate loans are 5 6 years in in, in you know uh, in in duration so the the bad loans that were given around that time you know basically came back as npas etc you know 6 8 10 you know 6 8 years year, years later so, so that's something that is really important to, so this is around starting from 2008 to about 2013, the loans, bad loans, that's what ended up, you know, affecting the quality of investment. So there are important lessons. Therefore, we should be following what we did during the Asian financial crisis and avoid what we did in the, you know, in the, in the global financial crisis, apart from the fact that the, you know, the stimulus was not withdrawn. The bigger problem was that the stimulus was not well directed. It was not, you know, it did not go into into you know good capital spending. You know, the the spending in the Asian financial crisis was most capital spending. You know, on on um, uh, you know, for instance, the golden quadrilateral. In contrast, the 2008 crisis the spending was mostly revenue spending to, and no reforms, and there was um, also you know um, the, the 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 bad lending created the NPA crisis. All of them together, therefore, created the taper tantrum in 2013. So there are important lessons to, you know, while we had nine, you know, eight, eight, eight and a half, nine percent growth after the when the measures were implemented well, we had basically the taper tantrum and the major measures were not implemented. So it's like, you know, black and white, very good lessons to be learned there. Thank you for that uh, response, sir. Uh, very comprehensive. I would like to ask another question. Uh, the United States has been putting hand, money into the hands of people. Uh, uh, Donald Trump signed off on a two trillion dollar package, uh, giving money up to uh, giving sums of up to twelve hundred dollar directly into the hands of the people. Now there is a view in India that the government needs to do this. The government need, government needs to put money into the hands of the people in the during the pandemic. So what is your view on this supplementary income? And do you believe we have the fiscal resources for the same? So firstly, you know, let's let's keep the fiscal part, you know, because I think in times like this, it's far more important to basically think about what is necessary. Um, first distinction to make between United States and India, United States does not have a public distribution system. So, you know, they therefore have to have to basically send checks, you know, they, people cannot go and take cereals or, you know, uh, sugar you know, pulses, etc., from the public distribution system. India has also done a lot of transfers. In fact, you know, the um, uh, entitlements were increased significantly. It was not done through cash, but it was done through kind, which is which is as important to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, that's that's point number one. Point number two, you know, there were cash transfers that were also given to the vulnerable sections. Um, but what is you know when you when you look at the data. What happened is that, you know, during the time of the lockdown, if you look at the PM JDY balances, PM JDY is the Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana. These are bank accounts for the, for the poor, you know, uh, 40 crore accounts actually at the bottom of the pyramid. I was observing that the deposits in these accounts, you know, very closely during the time of the lockdown. During the time of the lockdown, the balances increased by about 20,000 crores, you know, in these 40 crore accounts. Which means what? On average, the balances increased by 500 rupees. Now, this is a section that typically spends almost 100 
percent of their earnings because their their their, their you know. propensity to consume something that you know the term that we economists use if they earn 100 rupees they're most likely to spend the entire 100 rupees this section of the population also was saving a lot during the cash cuts that went into them basically they saved why because when faced with a crisis all of us resort to saving to basically take care of a rainy day and in fact you see even deposits in the you know overall deposits have also increased the reason i'm bringing this up is that you know it's important to keep in mind that just plain cash may not bring consumption in the economy in fact research or you know using the uh, the the checks that were made by the in the united states there's research that shows that that has been spent only on essential items there's you know i've read research working papers written by scholars at the at northwestern university at university of chicago you know and and some of the other top universities where they've looked at this the, the, these checks that have been mailed they've been used only for essential items has not been done, you know used for for durable goods and that's something that india has done using the public distribution system so i think it is important to actually keep in mind that the that stimulus has to be thought through carefully you know um, and you know it it has to it has to have an element of employment also in it okay thank you so i think you know that would be the last question if maybe a short question if any one of you has i think um i would basically want to to uh, um i mean we'll have sure to yeah up. yeah sure aya why don't you go ahead and ask the last question on on sort of advice to youth and and what not yes. uh, so my last question uh, is basically about the youth uh, so many people in india the youth in india especially nowadays are encouraged to go into a stem education everybody says go into a stem field do computer science is the emerging field so could you please elaborate on the importance of economics uh, uh, economists in india and how budding economists a young budding economist can take his or her career future uh, forward in india the indian economic service what paths are open to them and if you could end with a little piece of advice for our viewers so firstly i think we discussed this partly arya you know earlier um to when i was ans answering sanskriti's question um so my first advice actually is you know not just economists but all young indians is you know do what you what you enjoy you know and try and um, understand that by the way career choice is a, is is a lot about understanding yourself very well about understanding what makes you tick um so you know whether it's economics or stem or any other discipline you know do what you enjoy i think if you choose what you enjoy all the other stuff that we care you care about or i care about you know materially will come to you so that's the um, now on uh, you know on on economics itself so i think you know i am a a, a good example of uh, somebody who started from stem and then you know moved into into economics so you know if, uh, so so uh, the the good thing about economics is that it's a very nice mix of both the both the hard and the soft skills um you know it's a um, and in general you know in in order to 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 do well you know succeed in life you need you know uh, you need iq you need eq mm, you know and you also new need sq so intelligence quotient emotional quotient and social quotient um, the emotional quotient and social quotient are actually of course quite related um, so economics is a discipline that you know combines the iq and the eq in some sense the you know the, the softer skills as well so i think it's for those of you who are interested who actually would like an analytical discipline but at the same time also you know want to be involved you know in something related to society economics is a very good discipline to 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 think about um you know in terms of general advice i would actually just um give you know three pieces of advice um something that i used to uh, you know this used to be the last slide in my class you know um on on the, the last day i would say it. so just three uh, broad uh pieces of advice number one if your only goal in life is to be rich it shows an extreme poverty of ambition number one number two genius is 
99% perspiration and 1% inspiration don't forget the 99% perspiration part and last but not the least i would say you know um, and especially i think in times like this um, this has gotten highlighted is that all of us in life we juggle many different balls you know um, our, our personal life our career you know professional aspects uh, friends many different balls that we juggle with um i would actually you know use the parallel to, to say that your career your professional you know life etc i i would you know equate those to be rubber balls which um, you know even if you while juggling if you basically lose sight of those balls for some time they will fall to the ground but they'll bounce they'll bounce back and you can pick them up but you know your your health especially you know i think covid highlights very well is a glass ball that if you lose sight of you know while juggling it will fall to the ground break into pieces and you will be left then picking up the pieces you know so think remember that the, that your health is a glass ball that you should not take your eyes off similarly your personal life is also a glass ball that you should not you know uh, take your take your eyes off so i think those are the three pieces of advice that i would give all youngsters um and i think lastly i would say be honest to yourself and and be honest to the country and on that note thank you so much for joining us dr subramanian you have been very generous with your time and i think we've all learned so much from our conversation today we are wishing you the best and you're in our thoughts thank, thank you, you so much sir thank you so much sir Thank you. It was more like a lecture to us than an interview. So thank you so much. It was just like us sitting in a virtual lecture, like we are doing right and now. And absorbing, really. Yes. The most interesting lecture I've ever had. Second. We hope you will come back in the future.